Hello and welcome back to the studio. Uh, I'm Ian Jindal, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Internet Retailing, uh, but I also run RetailX, which is our research business that has been, uh, for the last decade, uh, looking into the performance of the UK's top 500 retailers and brands. So um, I suppose you could call this an anniversary, uh, although we are going to focus very much on the uh, brand new 2024 ranking. Uh, and in order uh, to discuss that with me, so you're not just stuck with me uh, in the studio, I have three wonderful guests, um, but rather than just leave you with their picture, I think I'm going to uncloak and show you what they look like behind the LinkedIn photos. Uh, gentlemen, welcome all uh, to the studio. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. Um, let's kick off. Uh, tell everyone who you are. Uh, Geoffrey, you start, then Angus, then Martin. Uh, Geoffrey, welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Geoffroy Riquet. I'm one of the regional sales manager at Avalara. Avalara provides a, uh, a platform to manage all the indirect tax uh, requirement for our clients, from the sales tax to the VAT management and also uh, the new invoicing requirement that are launching across the world uh, with different slots. Nice to be here. Great. It's lovely to see you. And of course, um, Joffa, uh, you have worked with us on a number of other reports, for example, our Australia 360 report, etc., etc., uh, and our global research. So it's um, a great pleasure to have uh, someone here uh, who can see that global view. Uh, Angus, uh, tell everyone who you are, sir. Uh, thanks, Ian. Yeah, I'm Angus Heyman from Akinio uh, with a product experience company. So we help our customers create great product experiences all the way through the purchase journey from discovery to purchase and then after sales. And we do that with um, systems that help you take product information in, enrich it uh, within your business and then um, tailor that for all the sales channels and marketing channels so that you're facing creating great experiences relevant to that customer in that language in in, in that channel um, and we do that for luxury businesses um, like lvmh all the way throughout down to and across to uh, deep range uh, business supplies uh, retailers um, I'm, I'm particularly interested to, to to in this report and, and to join this conversation because most of my career has been in uh, e-com retail and uh, including about 13 years running digital in one of the businesses that's in the, the top 500. So, uh, yeah, great Ooh. to be here. Lovely. You have to tell us about, and I admire your diplomacy uh, by comparing luxury with deep retail, not saying anyone was luxurious. I think that was uh, a masterstroke of politics, Angus. Thank you. Uh, cool. Martin, lastest but not leastest, uh, tell everyone who you are. I'm uh, Martin Shaw. I'm the research director at RetailX. My team and I worked on this report and also our other reports, such as the Europe Top 1000, our sector analysis reports, and um, our market reports, where we take sort of more of a macro view on what consumers are doing. Great. Well, look, um, since you're talking, why don't you lead us into uh, the first slide? This is for um, young eyeballs, uh, and I should say, by the way, <laughs> that, um, we're showing you some slides today. There's no expectation you can read them. They're more decorative, but you will get, uh, by email following uh, today's webinar, you'll get the link to download uh, the top 500 in high-res glory um, in time to both digest uh, and share. So, uh, Martin, let's just focus initially, please, on... Um, you know, who are the tippy top of the top 500 this year? So the elite this year are, are Amazon, Apple, Ikea, Next, Screwfix, and Tesco. Mm -hmm. So these companies um, have been in and around the elite. Uh, in, in Amazon's case, it's been elite for 10 years. We've got another slide coming up showing, showing that. Um, many of the others have been leading throughout. So uh, these are the, the best companies based on 300 to 400 different metrics that we've um, assessed uh, this past year. We, we've looked at four different value chains. We've looked at uh, the customer, the product, uh, operations, and capital. And um, yeah, they've come out on top. 
So if, you, if you're interested Great. in seeing other companies in the list, please do download the report. And we're not going to read through all of them here, of course. Uh, lovely. Well, maybe just tell us who the changes are then, because um, mm. there are 33 new entrants. Um, you know, we're seeing, for example, uh, at the top end, Boohoo and Fitbit uh, coming in, but then mm -hmm. um, you know, just entering the top five hundred is a whole pile of um, new, new to us anyway brands. So, um, what if anything we take from this? Uh, you know, my first point is it's obviously quite a dynamic index, and uh, we're seeing a lot of change, especially with a lot of the software yeah. companies moving to. Mm -hmm not just sell via resellers, but sell service, do subscriptions online. So a bit of a shake yeah. up with entrance there. Uh, any other readings you have on this? Uh, well, I would say just outside the top 500, there are lots of companies that are close to being in and, and just small changes, relatively small changes to revenue or e-commerce traffic or the number of stores they're operating can uh, push them in or out of the list there just because it's a very sort of competitive space. So we do see that change happening. And, and just as a reminder, when we do these um, lists, we're looking for membership to see who's the, the largest company um, before we actually rank them on their performance. So the largest companies uh, come, come down to how many eyeballs are you getting to see your products, to see your website, how many stores or how many physical sort of locations do you have around and um obviously the the financials underpinning that as well so um yeah there's there's a number of companies where we measure the retail elements of those and obviously it's a much larger company so uh you might see some big uh brands for example that are mostly wholesalers and you think well they seem to be quite small in this list well maybe that's because their retail operations which we're assessing here are relatively small mm. good that's a very good point actually and um you know we'll we'll come on i think next to look at that blend of channels um before we go further um a, a question to uh joffre and angus um maybe using the benefit of hindsight but um it does strike me uh, when I look at the list every year that um, the, bet, the best are getting better at an accelerating rate. But for people who are maybe second, uh, you know, followers in the market, it's also getting easier and cheaper for them to just turn on capability. So I don't want to mention individuals, but you know, you can do more now in three weeks with a credit card using a self-service interface than you could do in um, two or three years back in the noughties with a multi-million pound budget. So it seems to me that the pace of change accelerating, the ease of access uh, is accelerating and therefore it's getting harder to stand out. So um, maybe I'll pick on you, Angus, first and just say how, when everything's getting better and easier, can somebody just wake up and say, I need to stand out. What are the, um, you know, what are the the, the ways you think that uh, boards should be discussing stand out now? Yeah, I, I think that whilst the, the, there's that that rich choice of of options to, to to build an experience and build an offer, your um that that's that's a lot of complex choices, um, and it's particularly challenging. You know, the report goes back to the the situation we're in, the state of the economy, the the higher um, base costs coming out of COVID and, and, and disruption in the world, um, and, and and ultimately customers having less disposable income. So, I think there's you've got to to get cut through. But when you again you look at the report at um, particularly what what customers see, what their experience is, um, most of the top five hundred are. Um, 95 plus ticking the checklist boxes around the components of of a customer offer they you can filter but in in various ways you can um, search and discover products and, and all the kind of relevant um multiple images are there in, in very high percentages across these these 500 so mm -hmm. um i guess i would i would say that given the challenge of the of the economy and and what you want to to achieve you've probably got this choice between 
um, uh, one big one big change, one focus on one big number and, and try and move it, um, or you're looking at something that's going to have some impact across across your whole business. Um, and certainly, the customers um, that, that we work with, Kineo, um, are looking at that that cross business impact, um, and and uh, I guess that's where. I see product experience impacting all the measures that the multi refer to the customer, the product, the operational efficiency, and the and the capital returns. Because if that, inf that you know when your when your product meets your customer, that's that's essentially what your the business is built around. Um, and mm. but for that to happen, you've got to um, have a process to to pull that together and and, and present it. Um, you're going to get your sales by. Um, Getting that information out there, particularly in Google, you know, fifty percent of product purchases start with a with a Google search. So, how do you how do you get up the rankings? How do you give customers confidence, and then how do you get them to come back at their expectations? And then, and then to get cut through, how do you um, how do you tell tell a story around how you're differentiated from everyone else? So, how how are you going to um, be able to justify the price and, and the margin? I'm saying so that that would be that's certainly the conversations that I'm in. Um, C Salt is one of our customers there in the um, the leading group, um, and you, and you can see that the simplicity of the, um, the 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 way they present their products to, to customers it's 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 very clean, but it's very yeah. easy. you can you can um, navigate by swatches of colours and patterns and um, yes. find find what you want and and smell the sea air as well. Um, Joffre, when when you look at this, um, often uh, you know, say for example about Australia or the US, you'll see many uh, UK brands retailers who are uh, you know projecting uh, their image digitally, maybe with stores internationally, having to really fight it out, not just amongst themselves, but in a very mature, demanding market. So uh, Angus has talked a bit about uh, you know the need for great product descriptions, great storytelling interface of the customer um what are you seeing how how can retailers stand out or rather avoid falling behind when it comes to showing themselves maybe on an international stage well i think it's um i think i'm, I'm going to go boy to go back on the point that angus made um on the experience of the customer i think for any retailer the key is to have repeating orders from the customer and in order to do so, you need to give the best experience to your customer. So you need to make sure that if they buy, they've got the best experience in terms of the product, but also in terms of the delivery, in terms of the charges, the prices, and so on. And I think there's nothing worse than when you are selling abroad or buying, or you are buying from uh, an international company is to end up with an additional bill on, on the, on the, the cost or things are not clear in terms of the, of the VAT determination and so on. So having some clarity in terms of what you're buying, what you are paying for is for us, from what we've experienced, one of the key success of any company who is selling abroad, having this mm -hmm. transparency of I'm buying, I'm selling this to my client. This is what he will have to pay in terms of his VAT, in terms of his tax, in terms of the duties, and making sure that there's no surprise, there's no um, additional charge that would come at the end. Giving this transparency yeah. to the client is the key for uh, any success, uh, any returning success for business. Yes. It's interesting because we've also seen a similar thing with um, postage, whether that's uh, within a country or internationally, is if you can't say to a consumer on, as they're considering the product, what it cost them when they're going to get it that they explicitly turn away from that so um i can feel this idea of giving them everything they need transparent but also wrapped up uh, in service um let's move on to another thing that's uh, i think changed over time which is the mix of um business types so on this chart you can see year by year um, the percentage within the top 500 by business types. So these are people who are either retailers, so predominantly saying um, other people's products to consumers, brands saying direct, saying their own products to consumers, and marketplaces 
uh, who operate on a marketplace model, which is multiple sellers all aggregated in a basket, sometimes with you know, specialisms or um, C to C as well. But generally speaking, they're the three, oh, they used to be the three uh, distinctions, but things have changed slightly. So from the naive, early, happy, simple days, Martin, of 2015, where we had, um, you know, just retailers and a few marketplaces, uh, we seem to have ended up with a much more heterogeneous uh, market now. Yes, so uh, brands and marketplaces are, are bigger. Uh, they've, um, as in a, a bigger percentage of the list, and some retailers, some of those retailers have become marketplaces. So they've they've introduced their own uh, third party sellers sections on their on their websites. Um, much of the change is driven by more brands going direct to customer companies that were previously wholesale. And the third thing that's that's uh, different is uh, retailers themselves are also selling through marketplaces, not just through their own websites. Mm. So it, it would be very hard to pick out who's winning and losing here because it, it's more just businesses are doing things that were previously would have been thought outside of their own lane, but they're um, adopting more of those other practices right. as well. Mm. And um, you talk about own lane, but in a way the consumer wins because she sees every product in the universe available wherever she looks and can then uh, literally arbitrage on price delivery where she happens mm -hmm. to be, if her thumb is tired, the bus journey is ending, etc. So I can understand the consumer uh, perspective. But um, Angus, we, you know, we talked a bit about owning the experience based upon uh, product knowledge to begin with um and joffa we then talked about the challenge of pricing especially with selling into international markets using a marketplace as your market entry strategy so uh, angus maybe you first um how do we manage to make sure that um when there are a gabillion alternative items that i'm searching filtering scrolling through um, what can we do to make our products come alive, even when it's not on our own sites? Yeah, sure. I, I think I think what's what's really interesting about that picture is you used to open a shop, so you could you could sell things to the, to the customers who came into your shop. That 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 mix now of um, marketplaces, brands going direct, retailers curating offers means that those those channels and where retailers, retailers choose to to put product have got different objectives. So you know, if you're if you're a brand and having worked with brands around marketplaces, marketplaces is to a degree a marketing channel to get sampling of, of products that you may put your uh, kind of a narrow range, but you want to put it in front of all of Amazon's customers. Um, but ultimately you want to transition that customer through um, inserts and, and and the like to get them to then buy from your your, your D to C site. Similarly, with a um, you know big high street retailer with a with an ecom arm. Um, you know, my experience, we've used eBay and Amazon as clearance channels because you're you're doing something different with a different price for a different customer set, um, and you you want to. Mm -hmm present things things differently so i think the, the first perspective is when you've got this as, as a retailer you've got all these options of channels what's each channel trying to do for you and then once you've decided that what, what who are the customers in those those channels and what do what do they need and then what does the the channel operator need so simplistically Amazon needs some some bullet points to populate um, a description scenario. There'll be character limits. There'll be um, particular Amazon specific attributes that you don't use on your own site. You don't use use elsewhere. Um, so taking control and pulling all that information to a single location where you can see it, and then actively choosing to say, right, we're going to create this experience in that channel because that's our clearance offer. Um, customers of, of this type um, and the, the channel requires these things quite different to what we want to show as our you know our premium offer mm. perhaps our main site um, and and that's that um, 
that ability to, to take control is there's quite a lot of hygiene stuff around pulling the pulling that content together but once you've got it you can then yeah. deploy um, as you wish and i think that's that's the series of decisions that we, we tend to go through and so when we look um internationally um i can manage maybe controls on my own website uh but all of a sudden i might be saying through others are there any considerations that we should have when we're um, approaching the world via other people's channels? Yeah, absolutely. Um, once again, I'm going to bounce on, on what Angus said. And <laughs> one word that he mentioned is taking control. Um, he, obviously, when you, you're setting directly, you've got your own obligations and you most of the company will meet those obligations. But when you sell through internationally, the likes of Amazon, there are still obligations. Everything is not only left to Amazon to deal with. There are obligations that you need to meet um, because the authorities will not, um, will not forgive if you haven't met those obligations. So as I said earlier on, being ahead of the curve and making sure that you know what you have to do with this obligation about selling internationally in terms of indirect tax um, is key for the development and for the perennity of the, the company. And this is how we, we help a lot of companies who are selling internationally, directly or indirectly through the likes of Amazon in the US or, or in Europe about how can we manage this obligation? How can we help you mm -hmm. to manage this obligation? And you don't have to worry anymore about that. Right. Just leave it to experts and we do the rest. Lovely. I mean, no one wants to get... Uh a letter from uh, a tax authority in another country and language. So I uh, totally agree. Um, let's um, do a quick overview now. So <clears throat> here's a chart we prepared earlier, uh, which looks at the 10 years of the top 500. So we're not particularly anniversary focused, but uh, it was interesting to see that um, if you look at the elite and leading together, that's approximately the top 25 of the 500 and uh, over 10 years 76 different retailers have ranked once or more as either elite or leading uh, and i've tabulated these um highlighting the top four who have been uh, in the top groups uh, at least well every year uh, since we've done it with a rather impressive showing by amazon uh, which has been elite in all of the 10 years um which I think shows not just how they were an early pioneer of what e-commerce could do, um, but uh, have continued to improve and extend their offering, remembering that they don't have direct shops. They just obviously use ours uh, for price comparison and uh, getting barcodes. But um, it, when you compare that with someone like a Tesco, which is very highly stored up uh, an Argos, it's interesting to see how those four are there, while also... Give me a shout out, I think, to uh, companies like um, Shu and Halfords, who, although they haven't um, ranked in the top, uh, the elite group, have been consistently amongst the top players, um, even in more traditional um, marketplaces. So um, I'll leave that up as we talk, because there are a few people to point out. You know, we've got uh, the ever lovely Screwfix, who's been there. Uh, for eight years, um, another supermarket. So, so very interesting um, people. Any thoughts uh, on who we see there uh, and what we can learn from that over a decade? Uh, Joffre, maybe uh, let's see if you have any uh, thoughts to begin with. Um, well, it's the, the international strategy. I mean, um, it's amazing to see that Amazon is performing so well and is, is uh, still at the top. Um, yeah, that's mostly the international side that I'm, uh, is striking for me. Yeah, excellent. It is also interesting to see how, um, although someone like an Amazon uh, or um, brands, maybe like Screwfix, which are part of, uh, of a European group, um, you don't really see the supermarkets extending far beyond national boundaries. So we don't, for example, have a, a Carrefour showing up here who on the European scale um, are enormous and uh, very well ranked. Uh, Angus, any thoughts um, uh, from you on uh, on this 10-year view? 
Yeah, I, I think it's. It, I mean, it, it comes back to having a profitable proposition. I think the, these businesses have all evolved their proposition over time, but have come to a point where they they found something profitable. Um, you know, I was in I was in books retail for a long time, and, and Tesco's um, tried it, couldn't make it profitable, but clearly have got a very profitable um, grocery business, and they found a way of of making that work through local delivery using supermarkets as as hubs so it's uh, th those businesses have um have tried stuff have, have evolved but but um ultimately you you've, you've got to stay profitable and i think you know you wind back for the 10 years before that and that was that was really trying to struggle as and, and businesses got away without making profit for a while um and then and then once you've done that you know the the, the customer experience sits on it on top of it which is everything from how you get found yourself as a as a brand and then how you get your products found and then um how people come back to you because you met expectations through um yeah buying buying something you buying something you expected because it was presented to you but also all of those critical delivery questions and, and you know the, the joffrey's points around the around the, the taxation just just feeling comfortable that you're not going to get shocked by anything it's going to arrive broadly when you expect it you're not going to get a surprise anywhere in that that relationship Yes, or not even me. I remember the first orders that went through in the noughties. Uh, I was surprised when it worked, whereas now you'd be surprised if it didn't work. So I think that's the uh, the shift. Um, I was just going to um, move over this uh, relatively quickly, mainly because uh, it's, uh, it's too detailed to cover now. But I think the main point is that there's a lot of analysis and data uh, by sector, by value chain, etc., within the report uh, that we're not going to cover up. We are going to pick out a few um, highlights, though. Um, so we've talked um, a bit about the product value chain, um, and we've mentioned both profit and uh, the importance of transparency here. Um, Martin, did you have any um, points you wanted to raise um on this uh, on this particular point so I'd, I'd just give a quick overview of what we measure in in the report again we're not going to repeat sort of pages of analysis here but uh, we measure about 50 or so uh, publicly visible metrics when it comes to doing something like the product value chain and those collectively give us some idea of whether retailers are making good buying decisions, whether they're using uh, the tools at their disposal to keep margins healthy, and whether they're continuing to receive value after a sale. So for example, by running a mending or repair scheme. Uh, thank you, Martin. And um, one of the uh, retailers were super pleased uh, to see um, topping the rankings again uh, mm. is Screwfix. And um, I would recommend uh, everybody have a look at this. It's uh, an extensive interview um, with Sue Harris, uh, who runs the digital proposition uh, and data uh, at Screwfix. So um, we've seen Sue over uh, many years uh, you know, in our conference and in our pages. So this is fantastic to see them, uh, you know, really demonstrating the benefits of their investments. And, um, you know, one of the things that she's uh, talking about in the interview is the move from five minutes to one minute click and collect, which is, you know, an absolutely extraordinary um, level of performance. I mean, we all joke about... Um, you know, how if you're on a job uh, for a client, you want to pick up product, you don't have time if you're on a yellow line outside a screw fix store. Uh, but this is quite extraordinary levels of performance. Um, what in particular, Martin, uh, did you like about, uh, you know, this, this not just return to form, but a triumphant return to form? Yes, Screwfix is a bit exceptional in, in the way it has continued to invest in the uh, the things you were mentioning there those fulfillment um options a, lo a lot of retailers have scrapped things like same day collection next day collection um and are even pairing back on uh, same day delivery um 
and the next day delivery has sort of plateaued in terms of popularity. So, so there are, there are these areas where um, I suppose that the market as a whole has perhaps taken a view that maybe the cost benefits not there, maybe most customers for most types of products are there, but, but something like Screwfix is uh, right mm. at the, the bleeding edge of, of that development. So it, it's uh, yeah. not surprising to see them uh, consistently up near the top of our list. What I liked about it was the absolute focus on the customer. So rather than saying we're just going to copy what everyone else does, um, which you know when they have fifty-seven thousand SKUs, they are not there are that many people to copy fundamentally. But instead of saying, "Oh, we'll follow the path of others," they really focus on this idea that time is money for their customers and lend into it. Yeah. And I know that when we were looking, for example, at the um, delivery capabilities we realize after a year or two that simply using the same carrier as your competitors with the same offer um you know the moment of genius was signing the purchase order but after that you just did as you were told whereas here there's nobody who would say don't worry yourselves leave it to me um we'll sort it out just you know, tick the box mm. they've had to do an awful lot of work behind the scenes with their stock their staff their workflow their product information uh you know how that works especially on mobile i mean there's a lot of work that's gone on here that is you know all about them and their uh connection i, I can see angus you're nodding there's, there no there, there's a lovely example in that article about um about customer focus, which which hadn't entirely struck me, which is the the importance of a tradesman having a car parking space outside the the place they're working in central London, and actually just the trip to go and get something means you've lost your car parking space. So it's not there and back; it's there back around the block a few times. Yeah. Um, therefore, being having a same day delivery to somebody's house or somebody's van is actually critical to to that particular customer in that particular location which is you know it, yes. outside of london it's not necessarily so much of an issue but it's yeah it was re- that that kind of yeah. um, was a real summary for me i think it's only parisians who understand that five percent of the city's population whether london or paris is at any one time circling their neighborhood <laughs> looking for somewhere to park so um <laughs> that that's the reality um, now joffa no, so I could comment on the parking issues in Paris if you want, but that's another <laughs> podcast, I guess. Uh, you'd better not, because when you get back, someone will have towed your car just to uh, to make sure. Um, now, from cars, SUVs and cities, um, let us segue straight into sustainability. Because when we talked um, in our planning conversation, um, sustainability was a point that um, you both raised, uh, as well as us, as um a very important one. And within the um, capital value chain, so uh, how you get a return for investors over the long term, um, we've been analysing more and more the importance of uh, sustainability um, throughout the top 500. Martin, maybe just um, tell us what we can see in the chart here, and uh, then we'll open it up for comment. Sure. So um, leading at the top of the chart, we have, well, first of all, we've got 2023 versus 2024, the percentage of top 500 companies doing the thing that is listed. And we've got four different things that we're showing. We're looking at the supplier, whether they've got a supplier code of conduct on their sites, uh, whether they have a recent sustainability report, um, whether they have a CSR or sustainability team, and uh, whether they keep an archive on their sites publicly available of um, sustainability reports from previous years. So in the um, first case, there's been a, a big drop in the number of retailers that are, that are doing that. Um, and it, there's been a, a couple of areas of, of sustainability research where we've noticed that. And um, our, our view on that is that it's a, it's a sort of maturing step and it, it's it, there. Are, there are a couple of reasons, um, both related to how difficult um, being good at sustainability is. And so uh, the the first factor there is uh, you better do it well, or you get accused of greenwashing. So maybe take a couple of years to think about it a bit more and and, and uh, you know, re-engage 
at a, at a better level. And uh, the, the other factor there is uh, companies that start out on this journey, like say, okay, let's, let's go to be a B Corp. They, they um, have to work it into all of their strategies. There's got to be a lot of money behind it. They've got to hire a lot of new people throughout the business and, and append these principles to all of the existing teams. It's a huge undertaking. And the more they look at it, the, the harder it is. And so I, I think in that respect, you see some people saying, okay, what's achievable this year or next, rather than um, reworking our entire business, we're going to do this in, in smaller steps. So mm. I think for those two reasons, we've seen we've seen uh, a stabilization in some metrics and then even a, a drop back in others. It's not because retailers don't care about sustainability anymore. And according to our consumer X research, it definitely isn't that uh, consumers care about it less. It's just um, I, I would I would posit that it, it's a case of um, doing it well and taking the time to do it well. Mm. There's a challenge here, though, isn't there? Which is, um, you know, I worry sometimes that retailers self-censor too much. <laughs> whereas, um, you know, is, is it that the consumer is so unforgiving that they would punish you for making three good steps forward and say, well, you didn't do 100% improvement, so therefore we hate you? So I think there's part of a maturing debate, which is to show your journey as much as making grand claims mm -hmm. um but also as we uh, as you point out um when we talk to retailers um there are many of them for whom sustainability is important um the customer thinks is important the manufacturers think is important but we don't have throughout the business um a locus for driving and changing sustainability it's kind of a shared endeavor mm -hmm. And with many shared endeavors, it's kind of hard to get that uh, traction time, mm. I think. Um, but as, as we look across Europe, we're seeing um, some pretty serious changes. I mean, for example, in France, they've started mandating that whether you like it or not, if you are a fashion retailer, you have to talk about your um, sustainability. I mean, uh, Angus, you were mentioning um, a retailer that caught your eye. Uh, in terms of what they're doing for sustainability. Um, I went and grabbed uh, a quick screenshot okay. in case people right. didn't know about them. Uh, maybe just tell us uh, um, a bit about uh, what we're seeing here at Ascot. Yeah, because I, mean, I, mean, I work um, across Europe and, and been talking to French retailers and, about the challenges they face because their regulations came in last year and they have to talk about um, not only where the fabric came from, but where each step of its treatment um, happened. Um, and Asket's a, a Scandinavian retailer we work with. Um, there, they lead on sustainability, but they show what's possible. And, and given the regulations that are coming down the line, um, France already, EU in the next few years, um, potentially what's what's going to be necessary. So, like I say, Asket talk about. Um, uh, about sustainability on the home page, but critically they talk about it on the product page so that they've got the, the information specific to each each product they sell. Um, and they're therefore meeting the, the, the customer expectation. The thing that struck me in the report was that, that as Martin said, there's, there's relatively little content about sustainability on websites, but 67% of customers, um, it's, it's important to them. Um, and, and on the product, uh, product details page on Asket, you get the, 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 the expect normal information you'd expect, but also this strip of content around um, traceability. And you can then see percentages, and to your point, Ian, around um, customers um, wanting you to be, to be open and showing a journey. And this is a business that's all about sustainability, but still they recognize that they don't have 100% traceability on absolutely everything some things by showing they're in the 90 percent they're showing they're, they're 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 trying to get that information um and that they're, they're trying to help you and actually our experience with them is customers first time are engaging with that content but once they've built a relationship and they're returning they're, they're not diving into that information rather than hitting the buy button Mm -hmm. uh, but they're reassured that it's there um, and that's all part of the brand story and the reason why you, you shop with them rather than, than someone else. Yeah. Like I said, the regulations coming down the line are going to make some of that um, more critical to, to all 
fabric returns. And so, Jeff, well, we'll have um, more regulation as if um, you know, the sales taxes, duties, uh, disclosures, cross-border reporting weren't bad enough. Uh, and if I add in re-commerce, second-hand schemes, different VAT treatment on whether something is or isn't uh you know, within the second-hand scheme. Um, any tips you have or thoughts on managing the additional complexity of uh, this product information, uh, not just in our own countries, but when we are looking to sell cross-border? Yeah, um, I think, like, everything is about how a retailer, a company, wants to manage this. Is Do you want to make all those investments internally to try to investigate all the different aspects, uh, all the different legislations, or do you have in your head your development, your expansion abroad, and what you have, you want to focus on? We, I mean, they are not, the, the retailers, I don't think anyone wants to spend too much time on taxes or on, on the new legislations. Even, even us sometimes it's like, wow, when we got this influx of information. So I think it's like Angus said, is being transparent, is being managing the expectations of the customers. And to do so, it's about which tool can you use in order to meet mm -hmm. those requirements. Uh, you trust uh, logistic companies for your shipments, you trust any other su uh, suppliers for different parts of your business. So let's work with uh, companies that have the expertise in that in order for you to be able to focus on your own business, on your own development strategy. Good. Okay, well, look, um, time is running out. So I'm simply going to uh, remind uh, our uh, dear readers and listeners that um, within the top 500, we have uh, an extensive set of um, case studies on those who are performing well uh, and in innovative ways. So um, we won't go through them now, but do, of course, um, take some time to look through them. Uh, you can access the report in a lovely PDF. Uh, all of the charts are um, reusable and available to you under a Creative Commons attribution license. Uh, if you think you need a super high res one, uh, maybe as your Christmas card or to delight your next board meeting, uh, just drop us a note, um, research at retailx.net, and we'll send you uh, whatever you need. So do ask, uh, and those who ask obviously will get. Um, but look, time has raced uh raced away with us. We've covered um, you know, the international, our product, the um, the customer experience, the importance of transparency. Uh, we've looked at um, sustainability. So we've covered off some big topics. Um, just as we uh, get ready to leave the studio, um, let me just ask you briefly for the one thing in the report that you want to carry away um, either to mull further or as the thing you'd say is the main point in the report uh, over your next dinner conversation with friends and family. Uh, Geoffroy, why don't you tell us uh, anything you're going to take away? Um, I think it's based on the on the, on the the Screwfix page and the example is how can you meet and how can you answer the client's need and how can you meet this, those requirements? Um, how can you make sure that they come back to you? They will come back to you because you can deliver the tools very quickly without having the the issue of parking, as it was mentioned. The same with any that. other retailer. Just yeah. how, how would they come back? Because they've got the best experience, they know what they're buying, and they know what they're paying from yeah. back to end. So it's um, that's the key for me, is like being transparent with your clients and having the tools that allow you to get this trumpet transparency wonderful uh, angus your takeaway please and uh, the operation section um references ai which is clearly um a big topic at the moment what i take from that is it's a mckinsey research that, that says about the fashion industry 73 percent of execs in the fashion industry are making ai a priority for this year but only five percent of them know how they're going to do that um yeah. and our, our customers are, are using ai quite actively to to information clean it up and then generate 
um, content. And the, yeah. I guess the opportunity is looking at Next as one of the the elites, looking around their site at a at a trainer which had two color variants, black and black dark. Um, they're, the, they're the same product, but they're creating a question for the customer and a choice, which is just slowing the customer down. So yeah, yeah. Even, even at the top end, there's 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 opportunity, which means there's opportunity for everyone. Unless you're my other half who can tell the difference between 16 shades of white. Uh, so I just have to say, yes, of course, uh, whichever one you like is, is the right of the 16 shades. So uh, maybe that's a, a specialism. Uh, Martin, did you have... Uh, you're immersed in the data. Do you have one thing that you're going to take away uh, for research and pondering? Uh, yes, for me, um, I think it's mentioned earlier in the webinar about um, uh, consumer research that was in the report. I'm very focused on, um, at the moment, seeing how retailers adapt to what consumers are recording as their key values and preferences and how those have changed a little bit over the past few years. Excellent. Well, that's a very good uh, note to help us end. So um, just with some advance notice of things, um, on the 14th of May, uh, we have our Spring Festival. And um, while uh, some of you will be in um, our wonderful conference venues, uh, amazing speakers, um, hearing what the best are up to, uh, Martin and I are running two sidebar think tanks so if you want to join us uh, in the morning uh, it's all about the consumer 40,000 consumer surveys brought together three topics closed doors uh, two and a half hours to chat with uh, 50 colleagues and in the afternoon we're doing the same with sustainability uh, looking at uh, 31 data points on sustainability on our top 1000 uh, what can we learn what are we doing what does the customer want um, all the data in advance, leaving us time for that one-to-one uh, -one chatting. So um, do join us for those, uh, 14th of May. Um, and of course, we'll mail you to remind you. Uh, you'll get a copy of the um, of the report. Uh, any questions, you know to mail us at research at retailx.net. And uh, I'd also be happy to hear from you um, what your thoughts are on AI. Uh, we have a an off the record meeting of what people are up to on AI, and we're working on an AI in retail uh, report, which will be obviously up to the minute. But um, give us the flavour of what you're doing, your challenges, your uh, enthusiasms, your ideas. Uh, we'd love to hear more. So that's um, that's what's uh, coming up. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. There's a, a download link there, but. You know and I know that I'm going to mail it to you anyway, so you don't need to transcribe it. And all that remains is for me to say a massive thank you to our uh, studio guests and supporters of the report, uh, Geoffroy, Angus, Martin, for all your work. Uh, our time is up. So uh, from the studio, it's goodbye and uh, wishing you happy trading. Thank you very much.